he said that this this is going to be an easy uh, lecture comparatively, um, and in some ways it is. Um, but if but there are like something like 25, 23 or twenty four papers referred to in this uh, in this thing. So if somebody wanted to read all those papers, it wouldn't be so easy. But he did point to just one paper as the recommended paper, you know, on the on the website. He recommended. Uh, see find that uh, let's see he recommended one paper uh, and that is his paper with uh, let's see this one nope not this one um, this one the the paper that Manning did with the paper that he did with uh, long at, at Stanford um, where they first um, they first did neural machine translation with hybrid word character models. Actually, this paper has three models. Joseph, you are just seeing your desktop if you're showing oh, anything. Uh, yeah. Thank you. Um, so let me uh, stop sharing and see why that's happening. Uh, let's see. So, okay. Let's try this again. Well, sometimes there's a way to share everything, but now I don't see how. Anyway, um, going to here. Can you see now the um, Firefox? Yes. Yeah, so this is the paper that he refers to as that is con it's considered recommended reading in his, um, in his directions for this chapter, for this lecture. Um, and then I was showing, I thought I was showing the schedule. Um, now I will show it. You can see it now. Um, sorry that about before it wasn't shown. So today uh, we do subword models. Uh, next week we do contextual word embeddings with Gautam. Uh, the following week is Labor Day weekend in the United States. So we'll take a break. Uh, and then we'll finally get to uh, attention. And Wen Cheng has been either participating in or leading the um, NLP paper reviews. Is that right, Wen Cheng? <clears throat> yeah, yeah. So I, I'm leading um, the BERT uh, paper right now, and we just finished the first um, section or session, uh, and we'll do some cold and uh, mathematics review, hopefully next th uh, the coming Thursday. Yeah. Great. So, it, so that would be great to do this in parallel. Is Wen Chang is the first one? Is the first session um, recorded, or are these sessions being recorded? Yeah, it was. It, it was recorded. Um, yeah. Absolutely. And and is the recording made available, or is it just is it, is it just there? Oh, um, I hadn't shared it. I will. Uh, and yeah, I will do that. And also, uh, Gotham did uh, Transformers, actually. Uh, oh, that's itself. right. That's, yeah. that's um, so those are both good sessions. And is that recorded also? Yeah, it was. Okay. That was the attention is all you need uh, paper and code? Correct. Correct, yes. Okay. So that would be good to review those, um, especially, you know, it's um, <clears throat> Wen Chang's paper reviews are ongoing. I think by the time we get to chapter 14 and uh, you'll be done with those reviews, right? That's right. I'll be done okay. with Bert, yes. Okay. So that's the recommended procedure is for everybody to follow along with those reviews on, and this is on the NLP underscore papers. If you can't make them, the sessions, they'll, the recordings will be available. And as Wenjing pointed out, Gautam already did the uh, attention is all you need paper and code in a previous session, and um, we'll make sure that that recording is also available. So yeah, for the next couple of weeks, we should, we should do that. We should re review those uh, sessions to get caught up uh, for, for this session here on Wednesday the 12th. Uh, sorry, uh, on Mon uh, Sunday the 12th. OK, back to our notes. So um, he starts off by, by going through some linguistics, phonetics. Um, didn't, this didn't do a lot for me. I mean, I'm, he says that morphology of words has not, not been studied, um, but 
some attempts have been made. I think there is one, um, there is one area that he hasn't covered, and that's uh, tr translating from sound directly into uh, into words. That's an interesting area, and I, I'm sure that some work had been done by the time he wrote this paper, but he hasn't mentioned it. That is going directly from audio files to um, translating from one language to another, or just within English. You know, just re you know, start with the audio and then translate it into English words. That's a that's a field in 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 uh, NLP, um, and he hasn't talked about that yet. Uh, let me close the window to get rid of the, some of this background noise that I'm hearing. Oh, that's better. We have uh, landscapers that come in the neighborhood and start at around, it's not for our house, but for houses that are nearby, and they start up at 8 o'clock, and they make a tremendous noise. Uh, okay, so he talks about morphology. And there's this thing called wickle phones. Um, I looked that up, and it, it appears to be like three, uh, like trigrams that occur commonly in words. Uh, let's see if I can. I pulled up that paper, uh, at least a reference to it. Bones. It's on. There's a small article on Wikipedia about it. Uh, and just it's just a definition. So a wickle phone is a sequence of three letters or symbols which occur together in a word, um, trigrams. So that's all it is, I think. Back to here. Okay, he talks about convolutional layers. I'm not sure what he's talking about here. Um, By the way, Joseph, we are just seeing your browser since you just oh, shared the browser. Oh, jeez. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. Um, stop, share, and so I remember when I go back and forth between uh, PDF and browser, I have to. I think there is an option to share the entire desktop. I did, I did. Yeah, I did that once, and I did that at first, and now I and um, now I can't find that option again. So when I go to the, the share, first option. Yeah, let me try it again. Um, return to meeting. Okay, share screen. So, uh, Should yeah, be share it, screen or share desktop, something like that. Yeah, I've seen that, and but, and that's what I did at first, but when I went out of that, now it doesn't. That option doesn't appear anymore. I only have. Oh, okay. Wait, maybe screen. To, ah, this is the one that I want. Yeah, this is it. So now you should be able to see my. Yes. Okay. And do you see the Wickle phone from Wikipedia? Yep. And okay. you see the PDF behind it. Yes. Excellent. That's what I want. Okay. So here we are. So he talks. I, I don't really know what he's getting at here when he talks about this. I didn't look up DSSM. And yeah, I'm not sure what what's going on here. But he passed over that really quickly. Then he talked about how uh, even within writing writing systems, they represent words differently. Like he talks about in some languages, there's no no segmentation between words, um, but in English there is. And then he talks about um, Clitics, which uh, again wasn't very clear, so I went to I went and looked it up. So I'll, I'll look at that. I'll uh, pull that up in a minute. Um, I this to me doesn't look like a clitic of the way it was defined in, on Wikipedia, but we'll, we'll look at it. Um, he talks about compound words. Some languages uh, like German make, uh, and and I guess we've seen also Turkish from the fast AI NLP class that. Uh, it it builds words by adding suffixes on top of suffixes, and so and so he's basically pointing to limitations of word models. That is, uh, a word like this is uh, is going to be very rare. This German very long compound word is going to be very rare, and so it's not going to appear in vocabularies very much. But you still want to be able to uh, translate it, 
And he's pointing to the idea that, we, that if you go with character-based models, um, you, have, you, you, can, you can actually translate words like this. Um, on first thought, character models, you know, English has only 26 characters, and you would think, oh, that makes a, a much smaller vocabulary than the 50,000 words that we're used to dealing with. Um, but then he says that if you use um, um, the y Unicode, there are approximately 200,000 different uh, characters possible with Unicode. So that's not really making a smaller vocabulary. Um, but I, I guess if you use some subset of Unicode, um, you should still be able to do better than 50,000. Um, let's go look up clitics on, I think I had done this on, oh, let's see. Yeah, so there's this brief uh, article by this grammarian guy, and it looks like the most common clitics are things like this, like they're, uh, they're, they're like, if you add something at the end of a word, uh, to abbreviate the next word, that would seem to be what they're talking about here. So, but it gets more complicated than that. So you could say the student's assignment, that would be a simple use, but then you could also say, you know, the, the apostrophe S could extend to a word that, um, that is far away from student, but it still refers to the student, like the student of psychology's assignment. That, that's very awkward, but I think it's still possible. Uh, the student that we invited assignment, the student dressed in red assignment. This is um, very awkward constructions, but they're they're actually legal. So, um, and here's another one. Um, I guess there's a double one here. Women's of not two two, uh, two abbreviations. Uh, then he talks about different kinds of of clitics, ones that go at the beginning of a word, ones that go at the, the end of a word. Um, beginning of a word clitics are called proclitics. Um, they're very rare in present day English, like do, um, tis, you don't really see those used very much. And then, and then there's an example of a word that has a both, uh, a proclitic and an enclitic, a clitic at the front of the word and one at the back of the word. Um, so that's my understanding of, of what clitics means. Um, and we go back to his Uh, notes, and we see um, this is this is considered a clitic, um, but I don't really understand this why it would be considered that way. Je vous ai apporté des bonbons means I I took you some I, I gave you or take I took you some chocolates, something like that, or some candies. I have brought you some chocolates. No, not chocolates, candies. It's bonbons yeah. is candies. Yeah which I had said. All right, so, um, yeah. Okay, so now he talks about, you know, the motivation, the need for, for models that go below the word level, and he talks about um, uh, being able to handle large vocabularies which are open so that you could have occurrences of words in your, in your set that you don't have a translation for, and yet you can, that um, you, you don't have, you know, say if you're translating from English to another language or from, I think this is Czech. Um, if you're translating from Czech to the other to another language, you might not even have this word in your Czech dictionary. It might not be big enough, and yet you still want to be able to translate it into English. Um, and if you go to a subword level model, then it can do things like find, you know, uh, translations of the pieces and then put them together at the end. Um, and then also he talks about transliteration. Um, you know, you have to figure out somehow that the word Christopher in English uh, goes to Christoph in, in Czech. Uh, and then it also talks about wanting to be able to encompass informal spellings like you find on Twitter or, or other social media where people just uh, make their own, make up their own words uh, and, and abbreviations become common like uh, IDC for I don't care. Um, they just kind of occur uh, spontaneously uh, in these uh, new vocabularies for Twitter and, and social media. I'm a, I'm going to, um, that kind of stuff. So first he talks about character level models. Um, and, and the idea that you can get, you can get character embeddings and then on top of that, you can, uh, you can get word embeddings. Um, and 
generates unbeddings for unknown words. That the same thing as solving the OOV problem. OOV means out of vocabulary. Um, the other advantage is that similar spellings share similar embeddings. So, and that encompasses the whole idea of root words and everything. Um, so if, if you have words that may not be in your vocabulary, but, but share the root with other words that are in your vocabulary, then those words have a, a, a better chance of being translated correctly. Um, and then he talks about a just a, a character only model. So this is a, a sort of a hybrid model that you start with character uh, embeddings and then you go up one level to word to word embeddings. Um, then he talks about just processing it as characters, not even using words, just just characters alone. And he said both methods have been able to work. Um, and he was very surprised. He said that he didn't expect a character only model to work, but it but it does. Um, let's see, then he talks about uh, different kinds of language systems, um, systems that are based on on phonetic pronunciations, like each part of a word is, each word is composed of units that are phonetic, that is a unit of pronunciation, you know, that, uh, like, you know, G, Ya, Wu, those are three things, three different uh, phonetic uh, pieces of, of this word. Then he talks about fossilized phonemic systems like English, um, which he labels as a thorough failure. Um, a lot of the words that we see like, like uh, thorough, for example, um, the, the T-H-O-R-O-U-G-H, um, it doesn't make any sense when O-U-G-H uh, can be pronounced as, as like in through or as in rough. There are different, different pronunciations for these. And so anybody trying to study English, and among you, there's lots of you um, who understand this very well, um, it's really hard to generalize to learn the patterns in English because they're not consistent. Uh, it's it's not like like in German and Russian, for example, um, they're relatively easier to learn in the sense that the words are constructed logically um, and and there are very few inconsistencies. But English is not one of those languages. Um, then he talks about ideographic systems like Chinese, and then he says. Uh, where each character is a word or an idea or a piece of an idea. Um, and hieroglyphics are, are also like this, the Egyptian hieroglyphics. And then Japanese is a combination. I don't know Japanese, so I don't, I don't understand what, what he means by this. But you, you can see like this looks like a Chinese symbol. And so maybe um, he's throwing together, there's Japanese uh, characters plus uh, imports from Chinese characters maybe. Yes, uh, Japanese uses some of the Chinese characters. Yes, and some of the other ones are just uh, like letters themselves, or yeah, I, I believe so. Yes. Okay. Okay. I never studied it. Um, okay. Purely character. So now he talks about the purely character level models, um, referring to this paper um, that got strong results. I didn't go to this paper. Um, there are just too many papers referred to here. Um, purely character level neural machine translation models. Um, and his is one of them, the one that he taught, the paper that we're, that we're gonna look uh, more closely at that he recommended. Um, and he does that, and this is that paper, um, Long and Manning. Um, they did, they chose English to check translation as a problem um, to, because he gave some reasons for that. Um, the Czech is a, a rich language and it has these uh, compound words like German. Um, so it, it, it gave a challenging language. I gave it, uh, they chose it in one sense because it was challenging. Um, let me find the paper where he, where he talks about that. Um, let's see, since I can now share my whole screen, I can go to that paper. Oh, it's, it's here. Let's see. Yeah, so this is that paper. Achieving open vocabulary, neural machine translation with hybrid word character models. And I think 
he might have been the first one to do um, machine, neural machine translation. That means translating from one language, text from one language to another um, with uh, a pure character model. But in the end, he found that the pure character model, um, although it worked well, um, it took tremendously long to train for obvious reasons, right? I mean, if you have a sentence that is, and if you want to do sentences that are 50 words, that would be common for uh, neural, neural machine translation that are based on words. Now, each word has, on average, um, you know, five or six characters. So uh, a 50 a 50 word sentence becomes a 300 character sentence. And now you can imagine you have to do, uh, if you're doing this with RNNs and LSTMs, uh, which he does, um, you now have to do 300 backpropagation steps for the encoder and another 300 backpropagation steps for the decoder. So that's 600 total backpropagation steps. Um, and he says that took three months to train. So um, he said, that eventually they built, a, a, this paper actually talks about three models, the pure character model, the text model, and the hybrid model of character and text. Um, and the hybrid, so the, the uh, word-based model uh, only took three weeks to train compared to the three months. And the hybrid model took only 10 to 20% longer than that, he said. So that's, and then they, got, and they actually got their best results with that. So, um, so I guess this is the character-based model where he has, um, let's see. Uh, oh no, this is the word-based model, I guess. And, and he uses an attention layer um, to help with, uh, with to, to help get a, a, a good translation. Uh, this is a, English, French. So um, let's see, where was I going to go? Hybrid. I just wanted to find the summary first. So his, their hybrid model gave them the best results at WMT, I'm not sure, that stands for something about machine translation. It's some conference, yearly conference that uh, they look at machine translation. Um, and this was 2015 where they got the state of the art results with 20.7, uh, the blue score. But the next year, um, 2016, their results were blown away by um, a, another team that got 25 for this same problem, the English Czech translation. Um, I found that on Word, on, uh, I, I tried to look up what's the, what's the uh, state of the art now for uh, Czech translate, uh, English to Czech translation. And I found that, let's see, where is it? Yeah, it's, it was at the WMT 2016 conference um, and the blue score was 25.8. Um, and the, they give you the paper, uh, let's see. Oh, I didn't find. Anyway, the, uh, so, so the, the state of the art is, is now much better than it was 2015, but surprisingly, I don't, I don't find any better results than 2016. So 2016 is the state of the art as far as I can tell now. That is 25.8 blue score. So back to um, back to this paper. Um, I wanted I wanted to um, review why he chose uh, the Czech the Czech language. I remember in the paper he he mentioned um, yeah this is on page I can find it go here. Uh, let's see, it's on 5.1.5.5.1. Yeah, so the reason why he chose the Czech language is because it's, it's, uh, it has rich and complex inflection, but also fusional morphology. That's what we saw where, um, where you can have um, 
No, we actually, we didn't see this. So he's talking about uh, a single uh, morpheme can encode, can encode multiple grammatic, syntactic, or semantic meanings. And so he says it has a large vocabulary uh, and is challenging to translate into. That's why they chose it. And they also had a good amount of training data. I think they had like uh, something like fifth, let's see, up, up here, he talks about, they have 224, uh, I guess 15.8 million sentences that were already in their training set that were already translated. So that's a, a huge training set. That's another reason why they chose uh, that, why they chose Czech. All right, um, let's see, back to the, back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so he says, takes a long time to train. Um, he gives some examples of where the, their models did well. Uh, it turns out that in Czech, there's a word, can't pronounce this, it means an 11 year old. And uh, of course, humans can translate that. A, a, a human that knows English and Czech can translate it directly. Um, the word-based model couldn't get it, so it just threw up its hands and gave, uh, and just uh, uh, translate, uh, it just didn't even translate it, just put it in in English. Um, but the character-based model was able to get this thing uh, from English. So that's an advantage of the character-based models. It, uh, the unknown words, it can handle unknown words um, in a way that word-based models can't because it can find all the pieces of the words uh, and put them together. Okay, he refers to some other papers other fully character level uh, translations, uh, translators. And let's see, so here's the, let's see, words um, segment. I'm not sure I understand this. Uh, we talked about highway networks before uh, and bidirectional GRUs, these are, we, we talked about bidirectional LSTMs too. These are uh, LSTMs and GRUs that can go in both directions. You're allowed to go uh, not only predict forward words, but you're allowed to, um, to, have, uh, to have one, uh, one layer that predicts words backwards, um, which is something you're not allowed to do in, uh, in a language model um, because the whole idea is to predict the next word. You're not supposed to know what the next word is. But for um, machine translation, it, it, it helps and it's legal to know what the next word is going to be. Um, okay, let's see. He says, okay, he's comparing different uh, models for English to, let's see, English to French, Czech to English, and English to French. Um, he talks about character-based models and byte pair encoding uh, mo models, which we'll talk about a bit. But the main thing to see, and then over here is the size of the, the, size of the model. Um, and he's showing that for English to French translation, byte pair encodings didn't do any better than characters. But in uh, Czech to English translation, um, character-based models did better. Um, well, and they both did better, but uh, in both of these translations, the uh, character embeddings did better, but not too much better um, in, this, in this case. Here, it's starting, you're starting to get a clearer uh, advantage for, byte pair enco for uh, character encodings when you go to larger models. And then for this, um, th then he also goes by number of layers. I mean, shows that um, if you... And here, by, by number of layers, I mean number of layers of uh, LSTMs um, in, the, in the neural machine translation model. And here, the character model, character-based model um, is slower than um, byte pair encoding, which is kind of what you would expect. And, and the advantage, uh, well, first of all, byte pair encoding doesn't take more, much more time. It increases in time very slowly uh, when you add number of layers, whereas um, character embeddings um, does start to take more time. So here is a factor of four or so uh, as you go to larger number of layers. So this is kind of like an event um, pointing to why um, byte pair encodings might be might be good. Um, 
let's see. I want to get to where, okay, so here's where he talks, talks about bipair encodings. Um, and the idea is um, to look at, uh, I think they, they do uh, n uh, they do n grams like up to trigrams. Um, and then they look at the most fr frequent pairs um, of characters and that, uh, and then that becomes a new uh, n gram. So for example, if you have uh, three letters that occur commonly, then that, then that trigram get, goes into your vocabulary. So you build up your vocabulary kind of uh, incrementally and you basically decide at the outset, like how many, how many um, N grams do you want to have in your vocabulary? Say, you know, 50,000 or 100,000. Um, and then that, that becomes your stopping point. Once you reach a vocabulary of, you know, 50,000, whatever you designate as the size, uh, then you stop. Um, let's see. So this is kind of an example. You, you start with uh, just letters, with just uh, the letters, and then you start looking for combinations of letters that occur more frequently than others. Um, and then you start adding those, uh, those combinations to your dictionary. So, um, so for example, ES uh, is, is common in English, um, and so that becomes, something you add to your vocabulary. Uh, you go by frequencies, by, uh, by word freq by, um, sorry, by, uh, in this case, uh, bigram frequencies, how often it occurs in English. Um, and then trigram, you can also uh, add trigrams um, because they occur commonly too. And so you just keep building up your vocabulary with, by adding bigrams and trigrams until you've reached your limit um, which you decide beforehand whether you want, you know, X number of words in your vocabulary. So you, you basically iteratively build up your vocabulary and that's how byte pair, byte pair encoding works. Um, and then once then, and then from there, then that's your vocabulary that you start with and you just proceed, um, as before, as you would with a, with pure word vocabulary. Okay. Um, so, it, so as you know, we're saying the advantage of this is it automatically decides what your vocabulary is based on how many words you want. Um, and it turns out that WMT 2016, it did well and it still uh, did well in WMT 2018. Okay. It talks about word piece and sentence piece. I didn't go into these papers. Um, so again, it's not a character-based model. It's something, so they're trying to find something that uh, is better than just a pure character model. And, and that's, uh, that's what, that's what the um, bipair encoding was. And then that's also the word piece sentence piece model. And I'm not sure how that works. Um, there's a paper, there's a paper and code that he refers to. I'm not sure what this means. Word piece model tokenizes inside words. Um, yeah, okay, well that's kind of like the, the n-grams. It, it, it can use pieces of words for, um, for tokens. Uh, which is kind of similar to to n-grams. Uh, I'm not sure what the difference is between word piece and sentence piece. Um, maybe we can go here and just quickly see. Um, I think the difference is that in word piece, the whole corpus is first tokenized into words, and then we look at the most common n-grams. Whereas in sentence piece, the initial tokenization into words is not done. The, the whole thing is taken as a single stream of text, and then you look at the most common engrams. Hmm. But I don't know how the exact difference plays out, but that's how the working is different. Okay, and then um, white space is retained as a special token. So spaces are retained, but, but it's just considered as a text, as a whole stream of text. Yes. And then the, it just... Uh, 
yeah the special token would just be appended to words right example, so uh, sentence piece is used in uh, excel net and word piece would is used in bert so in bert in excel net if you tokenize you can see this special token that's added to each word after you tokenize it mm -hmm. so it just takes the whole um document as a text stream yeah. um and then looks for groupings within that text stream that are common mm -hmm. uh and and identifies those as the uh components of its vocabulary hmm. uh, so that was a useful link i'll share it if i get it now okay uh let me just take a quick look at at this link um or one of these links you could just look at the abstract for this paper maybe uh let's see I don't want, oh, it, it gave me the paper so I can look at it. So this is that paper for, um, for word piece or let's see if I can get it to be bigger. You, um, I want it to fit, oh, that's not gonna help. Well, that's not what I want either. Um, hold on. My computer is very slow because I have too many things open. Uh, back off of this one. Okay, um, I want to display it differently. That's what I want, okay. Hmm. Okay. So he's. Um, so this must be the word, the word piece thing. Okay. So he says so sentences are usually converted into unique subword sequences. Um, Subword segmentation is potentially ambiguous, and multiple segmentations are possible even with the same vocabulary. Um, I guess that means you can divide divide words in different ways, or divide words into pieces in different ways. Um, so here's something. Uh, here's an example, I guess. Hello world being divided in many different ways. Um, here's three pieces, I guess. Um, and then these are the encodings for them. For them. Um, there are all the ways to divide this in, or there are all different ways to divide this into three pieces. And then here is ways to divide it into even more pieces. Um, one, two, three, four, five. So there's one, two, three, four, five. Wait, that's six. Oh, yeah, he made this as a se as a separate piece so the the, the uh, space in between is one piece and this is two three four five six so there are six pieces here and each one this is the encoding for it um anyway doesn't doesn't help too much let's just scroll through and see what else there might be in here there's no pictures so except for equations Ah, here's a picture. Oops. Ah, too slow. Sorry. Okay. Um, I just wanted to get back to that picture. Ah. There. Oh. I guess this is blue score. Um, 
as opposed to hyper uh, the setting of a certain hyperparameter. So this is optimizing that. I guess it's not worth looking at this anymore. Uh, let me go back to here. So word piece, sentence piece, both made by Google. Um, and then as Gotham said, uh, Bert uses the word piece model. Um, and here's an example of how that works. It just divides words into uh, components, into pieces. Um, so we'll have to learn this when we learn BERT uh, in su subsequent uh, lessons. And this is what he talks about um, in, I think in his paper and some other papers, they use uh, character-based models to start with, um, and then they come up with, so there's a layer, a layer that um, does character encodings, and then um, it maps to words. So it's it's like a two-layer um, um, architecture, and this has been used for um, part of POS means part of speech tagging, and that's a an NLP problem that just basically says let's map each word into uh, what its part of speech is. So you know a noun or a verb or an adverb, that sort of thing. Each word has to be tagged with. Uh, you know, with what it's part, with its part of speech identity. Uh, let's see, I have something in chat. Let me see, let's see. Oh, this is from Gautam. Let's see, hugging face transformers. Um, so this is the word, this is the word piece tokenization. Is that what we're meant yeah, to see? Yeah, it just talks about all the types of tokenization. If you scroll down. Word piece, yeah, here word piece and below it sentence piece and it just talks about the differences. Oh, okay. So, okay. So we sort of have an idea of what word piece is. Um, uh, unigram. Um, unigram is just one character. Uh, Subword. I'm not sure what that is. Uh, sentence piece. Okay, so he says pre uh, all of the methods we've seen so far require some form of pre-tokenization. Um, so that means like you break the word into into parts, but then each part has to be tokenized and uh, converted into a uh, into a numerical uh, representation. Not all languages use spaces to separate words, so like Chinese, I guess. Um, this is a problem they solve by using specific, what's XLM? I don't know. Sentence piece uses the input as a raw stream. This is what Gautam was saying, right? Including the space in the set of characters to use so that some languages have the space and others don't. And then uses byte pair encoding or unigram to construct the vocabulary. Okay. I'm not sure what they mean by Unigram. I mean, unigram is just a single uh, a single character, right? So I'm not sure what it. I, I mean, I understand how you can use byte pair encoding to construct vocabulary. We went through that that iterative process, but um, unigram does that mean just use all the characters, and that's your vocabulary? Yeah, they have both. They okay. start with unigram as a basis, and then they add BP on top. But okay. I think that's what it means. Okay. So that's so that's from Hugging Face. I guess Hugging Face is the one that um, FastAI uses, right? When they um, they've integrated that into their uh, into their NLP part. Is that is that right? I don't think yet. Not yet, but they're working on it. The plan, yeah. Yeah, because because uh, Sylvain is now working for Hug Sylvain Guger, who helped to build uh, the FastAI two library, is working for Hugging Face right now. And by the way, I guess there's news that um, you probably already heard it that the fast AI, uh, everything is just basically dumped to the web. Now um, it's all available. Uh, the, the, uh, the new book, the new uh, course. Oh, uh, let's see. Where's the newest? There it is. FastAI releases the new deep learning course and the 600 page book. Um, the library, uh, FastCore, which we've been looking at and um, 
in Srinivas's um, sessions, when we look at the version two library, uh, the book, which uh, you know you, it's already there in GitHub, but now the paper version is available. Um, there was also a paper, and the let's see the new the new course is now available and uh, online the the videos and notebooks and some people are already talking about uh, doing a review session uh, for that. Um, I don't have the time to lead that, so it's out there. Somebody's trying to organize that, and there might they might succeed. Um, okay, back to the notes. Um, okay, so. We talked about bias bio STM that helps um, being able to go backwards and forwards. So you have two layers of LSTMs. Um, uh, helps in, in machine translation. And he refers to a paper, talks about that. Uh, and then they also use uh, bio STMs for character based encoding. Um, POS tagging and uh, hmm. This is just a, I don't know if they talk about translation in this paper. Character aware, neural language models. You didn't talk too much about this one. Uh, so then he talks about some architecture for this paper, which I didn't look at. Um, Character embeddings, a CNN over them, a highway network over that. I guess the highway network um, al allows you to make connections between previous pieces. And uh, remember, it's it's kind of like that identity. Um, what do they call it? Uh, s s uh, skip connection. Skip, yeah, skip connection architecture, where you add together a previous word or a previous um, the output to a to the output of a current layer, and then you concatenate them together. And the highway network is sort of a more generalized version of that uh, that allows more flexibility. Uh, and then on top of that, LSTM, and then prediction. I guess this is for language modeling. Um, I didn't go into the details of this, but I guess this is the highway network, um, or the or no, this is the LSTM piece. Um, so input, and then prediction. So Absurdity, the next word is is. So this is the language modeling task. Um, talk about, so I've, I guess we've talked about convolutions before, but now we're in the context of character level inputs. And then this is sort of a piece that we've seen before, um, LSTMs. And hierarchical soft max to handle a large output vocabulary, and truncated backprop through time. I, I'm not sure what that, um, what the the context of truncated means here. Um, it could, um, yeah. I'm not sure what that means here. Okay, but then I guess his uh, his punchline here is that the character-based model gets uh, comparable performance as, uh, and this is perplexity score, and low is good, low is better, uh, with uh, smaller models than um, previous than previous uh, comparable perplexity score. So, for example, here uh, a perplexity score of seventy-eight point four has a fifty-two million. Uh, compo uh, 52 million uh, parameter model, and this paper has uh, only 19 million parameters. So, but but they didn't talk about the time trade-off. I'm not sure what the time trade-off is there. Uh, let's see, qualitative insights didn't do a lot for me here. I don't know. Um, this looks interesting. This is a, a clustering thing showing that suffixes cluster together, prefixes cluster together, you know, when you go to these um, uh, subword models. And hyphenated things cluster together. 
Well, that's interesting. I don't know what the gray is. So, question the necessity of using word embeddings. Um, CNNs and highway network work well. Building blocks to uh, obtain powerful models. So that's going back to this architecture structure here. Um, building block components, you know, things that we've talked about before, character embeddings, CNNs, highway networks, LSTMs, all put together to build this language model. All right, um, hybrid. Okay, so this is the, <clears throat> the Lung and Manning paper that we started talking about. <clears throat> Best of both worlds. <clears throat> Translate mostly at the word level, but only go to the character level when the word is an unk, was an unknown, is represented by an unknown character. So when the word is out of your vocabulary, um, then you go and use the, uh, the character level uh, model to try to find it. Um, and they got success with this. They got the state of the art in 2015, uh, an improvement in two in the blue score, which is pretty good. Let's see. Um, no. Yes, okay. And so this is what that looks like. <clears throat> he has eight LSTM layers. And I guess each one of them has, um, I, I don't know if they're composed of, of uh, four, le four layers of, of bi LSTMs or if there's eight layers of bi LSTM, I'm not sure how that works. Um, so word level and then one word is not found. Let's see. Uh, so cute wasn't found, apparently cute wasn't found in the vocabulary. So then they started, they uh, went to the character level um, and they found a character level translation in French to be jolie. Um, and instead of having to, if you just did it by a word-based model, which is in this green thing, you would have to translate it as unknown, uh, which is not so good. So with this hybrid model, they were able to, uh, get the benefits of word-based models and, and character-based models uh, without having to spend so much time uh, as you would have to do if you did the pure character-based model. Remember, that took like a very long time for training. Uh, let's see, two-stage decoding, uh, word-level beam search, um, and a character-level beam search find the best, uh, so I guess you do the word, the word level beam search, which is normal uh, for normal models, but then this model has also a character level beam search. Um, okay, and he talks about the English check translation results where he got uh, better than the, um, better than the state of the art in, in uh, blue. I think they got 20 something or, close to 20, yeah, 20.7, which at that time was state of the art. Um, these are some examples. Um, five characters for word embeddings. This is another paper on, on going from character embeddings to word embeddings. So this is like something like character to word to vec, but using characters. And I guess the advantage is that if you have a long word that has a root, suppose this word, you know, this word might not be in your vocabulary, but spite, you know, spiteful might not be in your vocabulary, but spite would be. Um, and so maybe it, it'll then recognize that, um, that these two words are, are related. And um, then this is, from Facebook, fast text embeddings it refers to this paper, uh, which I didn't look at. Um, but apparently, it's it adds advantageous for rare words. So uh, let's see if we can have a look at this. Let's see.
I shouldn't see, what is it? Okay, so what is Fast Text? It's an open source free lightweight library that allows users to learn text representations and text classifiers. It works on standard hardware, blah, blah, blah. Um, and you can get pre-trained models, but uh, let's see, what is it? So is this a tokenizer then, or? Does anybody work with fast text? It just gives you the embeddings. Yeah, so it gives you embeddings, which uh, which is a token. So that means it's a tokenizer, right? It has a, yeah. a way of, yeah, a way of. So, but I don't know how it does it differently than uh, than the ways we've looked at so far, like uh, sentence piece, word piece, um, unigrams. Let's see. We can look at, maybe there's more information on Facebook. Let's see, quickly. Control C, um, boom, boom. Okay. Oh, I thought there would be some, some kind of an explanation, but it doesn't. Let's see. So the idea is it's enriching word vectors with subwords. So this is another subword um, tokenizer thing. I'm not sure which. Um, so I guess Galfam, you know something about word piece and sentence piece. Is fast text also considered right now? Um, State of the art, or have people gone to word piece or sentence piece? Which one is the one that people mostly use now? Does anybody know? Okay. Um, go here. So this is a paper. Maybe we'll get some more information from here. Okay, um, it's a short paper, so that's good. Okay. So it's it's just another way of learning of of, of learning representations for character engrams. So it's an extension of the skipgram model, which we already looked at, um, which is word to vec I think. Um, So it's just another way to make uh, to make uh, to chop words into smaller pieces. I'm not sure what the main uh, differences are. Just quickly scrolling through. Okay, so continuous bag of words is the most primitive uh, way to to tokenize, and the models here are. SISG and SISG minus and SISG, I guess. So that's their, their best model is SISG. Uh, this is German. I'm not sure what that is. English. So. Size of train data. So I guess this shows that um, this model, this red model SISG can can get to um, a, a good performance with less, with a smaller percentage, of, a smaller fraction of the data. So, uh, yeah, so even with 10% uh, 10, 10 of the data, it, it already reaches a high score. And 10%, when we talk about 10%, we're talking about 
fraction of a full Wikipedia dump. Uh, close my windows again. Okay, that's better. Uh, let's see. Uh, we're not getting much out of this. Um, anyway, I guess the takeaway is that there's lots of ways to tokenize uh, on a subword level, and we've looked at a couple of them: um, sentence piece, word piece, uh, fast text, and uh, and I'm not sure which one is now considered the uh, the state of the art that everybody uses. But I guess word word piece is probably a good a, a reasonable choice to focus on because that's what BERT uses and, and everybody now uses BERT. So that's what I would do. Um, let's see, a question from somebody. What if you have a lesser known language or undeciphered language? How can we go about that? Should a brand new word vectors be created and the model trained from scratch? Um, I don't, so the second part of this question is really interesting an undeciphered language. So um, this is kind of like the example of the Rosetta Stone. Yeah, you had um, you had three different translations of a text, <clears throat> and I believe that two of them were known, um, and one of them was was unknown. And and so they were able to translate. Um, they were able to from looking at the com from comparing the untranslated um, text to the translated text from the two different languages, um, they were able to um, to decipher the the, the third language. Um, so this is a really interesting question. What if you have a lesser known? How can one go about it? Should a brand new word vectors be created and the model trained from scratch? Um, yeah. So so let's just look at this for a sec. Um, this is a really good question. Let's look at the Rosetta Stone and familiarize ourselves with that really quick and see how one would approach it with a neural machine translation. In fact, well, let's just look at it first. Uh, Rosetta Stone, P. So there it is. There's three. You can see the three different uh, three different languages, um, and it's all translating the same thing. Um, so one of them was hieroglyphics, and the other two are different forms of Greek. Uh, well, one, sorry, um, ancient Egyptian, I guess, was known, and uh, let's see, three versions. Top and middle texts are in ancient Egyptian using hieroglyphic and demotic scripts on the bottoms. So these are the two. Demotic is Greek, is a Greek language. Sorry, no, Demotic is an Egyptian script that was known at that time, I guess. And the, uh, the bottom part was in ancient Greek. And the one that wasn't known is the, uh, the hieroglyphics. So this was used to translate hieroglyphics uh, by using known um, Demotic and uh, an ancient Greek. So the question is, um, how would you approach this from a neural machine translation point of view? Um, all of these pre-trained models will not help, correct? Let's see, I'm, I'm looking at, let me just put this into the screen so you can see the question. Uh, and this is the question. So, um, Code Zacks, can you, if you're still on, uh, can you um, sort of, are you able to, speak to your question and sort of ask it, uh, uh, explain more what you meant. So I'm asking, yeah, let me unmute. Uh, so do you want to ask, do you want to um, talk a little bit more about this, what you meant by this question? Are you still there? Oh, I guess they're not paying attention right now, so that's fine. Oh. He says he hasn't got a mic. Yeah. Uh, oh, he hasn't got a mic. Okay. Mute. Okay. Well, um, so let's consider it. So how would we go about doing this in a uh, neural machine translation? We have um, two of these, and we, need to, and we need to get the third. So these would have encodings already, and hieroglyphics 
we want to find their encodings. So I guess the first thing to do is to go to uh, to go to the hieroglyphics and invent some kind of a way to encode them. So you find all the hieroglyphics that repeat, you know, find all the unique hieroglyphics and assign some um, numerical system, you know, assign some numerical um, encodings to them. Um, let's see. Or, or just um, hmm, one hot encode them or something. And then the idea is we want to find the encodings that make sense of them. So let's see. I think this this could work if you had enough text. It, it we've seen that neural machine translation models take millions of sentences, and maybe even hundred million sentences, to do a good job, and we don't have anywhere near that. We probably have at most a few hundred sentences um, in these in these in this stone. So I don't think you could do neural machine translation a, a very good job of it. But I wonder. Um, so I'm sure that somebody might have might have tried. Let's see if we find any references to that. I guess I guess it's just not possible. <laughs> I don't see any references to it uh, with only a few um, a few hundred sentences. Uh, Joseph, I'm posting yes. some links on um, oh, okay. <laughs> chat, which give you quite. It, these are typically referred to as low resource languages, and there's whole theses and lectures on what to do in those kind of situations. Okay, so let me have a look at these. First, um, this is from Codesax. There is no Rosetta Stone for it. Then how would you use machine translation to translate it? Um, yeah, I mean, if you have a completely unknown language, if you don't have anything, if you don't have any text, a parallel text in some other language, then there's no way. I mean, is that, but if you have a parallel, if you have an unknown script like hieroglyphics and you have translations in other languages, then if you had enough sentences that were translated, you could, you could approach it. You could do it. Um, now let's see, this is from Srinivas. Let's have a look. And another one. So NLP for low resource settings. Ah, this is good. So this is the first question. Um, let's see what they have to say. don't have a writing system. Extinct languages, yeah. Um, yeah, so this is what I was saying before. Common NLP models require large amounts of trading data, unavailable for most languages, and you cannot find. Yeah, so like, for example, American Indian languages, there's, there's a lot of them, but, um, there aren't very many speakers of them. So there are some languages that uh, there aren't any speakers left. Uh, okay, so two main approaches. One, traditional approach focused on collecting more data. Approaches that apply, try to apply transfer learning. So let's see. So the first approach is just to get more data for each language. Um, you know, for example, there's English, German, European languages. They have lots of lots of translation data available, but for some of the less spoken languages, countries with small populations, uh, their languages don't yet have large uh, translated databases. So I guess that's the first approach: is just to keep is just to compile those databases that you can then, and once it gets big enough, then you can do uh, neural machine translation. Um, 
another, let's see, he says two approaches, two main approaches, approaches that try to apply transfer learning. So unsupervised learning does not depend on, la on manually labeled data. So um, brown clustering word vectors, unsupervised part of speech tagging, and unsupervised dependency parsing. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is interesting. Um, clustering vocabulary into word classes based on the intuition that similar words have similar distributions of words to their immediate left and right in two different languages, like in any language. Um, word embeddings. I'm not sure I understand what all of this um, is. Um, uh, Joseph, if you go to my second link on the CMU link and go to slide. This is the... Um, uh, no, that's the thesis. So yeah. there's a PhD thesis on the subject that you can refer to, but it's the one right this one. after the medium course. Yeah, yeah. So it's downloading right now. Go to slide 60. 60. Uh, let's see what slide it is. 62. I just be able to do it here. 62. So here they start talking about what are the approaches, and there are some pictures. The next one. Right. So this is addressing Kojak's question of. Um, a low resource NLP, unsupervised. So brown clustering is that thing we were talking about before where similar words would, would be in any language would be expected to have similar words occurring, similar words occurring uh, before and after them. Um, word vectors, unsupervised part of speech tagging. I don't know how you do that, um, unsupervised. I mean, how do you figure out? Um, in an unknown language, um, how do you figure out what parts of speech you're dealing with? Um, or maybe unsuper, well, hmm. maybe, maybe just some kind of clustering. Hmm. Transfer learning. Transfer of annotations via cross-lingual bridges. Well, this is one. The one. This is one we're familiar with. Uh, transfer learning. Train a model in a resource-rich language and apply it in a resource-poor language. So you could um, you could start with with word embeddings from from English, which is resource-rich, and then try to. And I think some of the UML um, UML fit uh, that UML fit paper. They tried experiments like that. Train a model in one domain and assume it generalizes out of the box in a low resource domain. So you get sort of a a zero order um, a model that may may not be the best, but it may work okay. Train a model in one domain and use only few examples from an yeah. So then, um, so you know, this is an example of taking, for example, English, which is rich. Uh, you get millions of Wikipedia, um, you know, data from mid Wikipedia articles, and then training, train, and using the embeddings generated from the Wikipedia text to uh, and and use transfer learning to get a language model for, say, medical uh, technology, medical uh, papers, or for legal papers, or something like that. And those are relatively compared to English as a whole; those are resource poor languages. Um, and you actually use, so you actually start with, you start with the word embeddings from the Wikipedia model, and then you improve them um, to, to build a specific language model for medical terminology or something like that. So I guess 
this means doing the same thing, but for some obscure language. You know, in other words, starting with the English embeddings, um, and then tr training them on. Even though you only have a small few examples, but you can still train them and uh, start with the word embeddings from from the English language, and then tune them a little bit based on some examples from the uh, less from the low resource language. Okay, polyglot learning. So, oh, this is interesting. You use uh, all the you use a joint model where you make use of a lot of different languages, some of which are resource rich and some of which are resource poor. Huh. Phones or multilingual word vectors. So data sets. Huh. When. Huh. I guess that's it for that one. Um, yeah, that's an interesting question, though, how that works. Uh, let's see. Source. Resource. What other? Let's come up with some um, strategies. Just what we saw. Oh, this is just a quick article. Uh, hmm. Anyway, it's a problem that's that's being studied, and I don't know um, what the best results are from it. Let's see. Okay, so there's some questions. On, there's some chat. Um, no mic can write. What if you have Rongo Rongo? Okay. I'm not sure what that is, but let's look it up. Okay. Um, a system of glyphs discovered in on Easter Island Easter Island that appears to be writing. But no one's deciphered it yet. So, yeah. So this is a problem where you have, you know, you have the glyphs, but you don't have any um, any clues as to what they might mean. Um, Hmm. I guess um, they are pictorial, so there may be ways to guess what the pictures mean. Um, let's see, what does this look like in close-up? Can't see it. Okay. Oh, okay, there, there, there's... So you could look at those and try to guess, like... Um, this must mean some kind of, this might mean some kind of a fish. Something with eyes, it could be a frog or a human. Yeah, so if you see, if you see glyphs that have no connection to your own reality, then there's no hope. But in this case, um, there are some connections. Like here, this looks like a man, you know, and... Uh, so maybe one could start by identifying those glyphs that you could, that you have guesses for, and go from there. Oh. But I don't see a way of using a neural machine translation technique for this. Let's see, five new messages. Let's see. Um, when he trained linguists, yeah. Yeah. Um, not if they were symbolic. 
Yeah, they could be symbolic and don't mean directly what they represent, but at least you have an idea, a clue from the visual appearance of it. You might have a clue as to what it means. I mean, if none of these were recognizable in any, if they were all just random shapes that you couldn't, that you didn't have any touch, uh, t you know, any, any place to touch base with them, then it's hopeless. But here there are at least some correspondences with, uh, you know, reality, uh, uh, you know, like this thing looks like a fish. Um, if you look at enough of these, you might be able to identify some glyphs that you that you could make sense of. Let's see, Robert Langdon. Uh, you can do occurrences. Yeah, you can do that. You can do. Uh, you can count. You can do counts. Um, you could figure out what fraction of of any given text is this glyph or that. That's a good idea. And then, uh, and then you can do bigrams and trigrams, right? Which things appear together, or which things are. Also, there seems to be a lot of repetition. Like here, this thing appears three times in a row. This one also seems to appear three times in a row. Yeah. So there are some things you can do, um, but not neural machine translation. No. Let's see. So Gautam, what did you mean by Robert Langdon? I don't know what that reference is. Uh, he's a fictional character from uh, Dan Brown books. Who he's a symbologist. He's oh yes, playing. of course, yes. <laughs> the symbologist, symbology yeah. guy. Yeah, good point. Um, yeah, well that's yeah. So that's uh, basically it. I sort of went through the whole uh, presentation, but not in detail on any of the papers that he gave. But I mean, the, the main takeaway is that um, recently we, we learned about word embed, word to vec and glove embeddings, but now there are better ways uh, that go subword, uh, that, that use subword um, tokenization that allow you to do a better job on unknown words um, and, um, and and in general, they're maybe a little slower than word than word-based models, but they but they get good results. And I think all of the uh, since 2016, when uh, the paper that we're talking about was written, um, all of the uh, state of the art in neural machine translation is done using subword models. So that's basically a takeaway. Um, I think we'll just end.